everybody, and welcome to another beautiful Thursday morning. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I have a great show for all of you today. My guest is going to be Dr. Jeffrey Rediger. He is the author of a wonderful book called Cure, and we'll tell you more about that when he comes on. But first, I want to talk to you about what's going on in and around the world, um, ways that you can take action, and of course, share my weekly recipe with you. So first off, I want to just share with you that um, last week for Thanksgiving, I collected a full sprinter van, hundreds and hundreds of coats that we donated to the East Flatbush Community Partnership. And they are handing those coats out to people in need. And for most of you that know me, um, for most of you that know me, I've been doing this work for 25 years. and this year, because of COVID, we were not able to cook, and um, but we were able to still keep collect the coats. And I am actually gearing up now for the Christmas holiday. Um, we're not going to do so much of a toy drive because there's so many organizations that do the coat drive, but we are going to focus on um, collecting more coats and also collecting used costume jewelry. I know if any of you out there are like me, I have so much jewelry, even though every year I'm giving it away, I have so much jewelry that I don't wear. You know, we only have one neck, one set of ears, you know, 10 fingers. Um, you know, there's only so much jewelry we can wear and we all have our favorites. So it's really important that we, um, that we unload it sometimes and give it away to those that are in need. And since there are so many toy drives that go on, you know, for the older kids, they don't really have anything that they can give away. So this is a wonderful um, opportunity to unload your jewelry box and to give some of that jewelry that you're not wearing to those in need. So um, please, um, if you can, make a donation of some coats and jewelry and bring them by the IE Green Homestead and I will get them to people that can use them. Um, some things that you can do to take action is most of you know, there are two Senate seats that are open and there is a special election happening on January 5th in Georgia. And if we win those two seats, um, we will not necessarily have a majority in the Senate, but we will be even with the Republicans and then Kamala Harris will um, be able to make the deciding vote. So we really need those two seats if we really want to um, get through some of the legislation that will undo some of the horrific things that the Trump administration has done. So please um, donate to that campaign. They really need all of our help. And um, I also shared some articles on the Environmental Protection Agency, which has been um, so changed over the last four years under this current administration. Um, it doesn't represent anything like an administration that would really be helping, um, helping our environment. It certainly has not helped our environment. So this is really um, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful article on the Environmental Protection Agency and um, what we can do to get someone in there that really can make a difference. So um, check that out. And also there was a great article that I shared from Ruth Rochelle who wrote um, an article about how our food has changed. And we'll be talking about that today during my, um, during my interview with Dr. Jeffrey Rediger as well. So um, anyway, I am so happy to be here with all of you today. And um, I hope you can donate to my coat drive and my jewelry drive and sign on to the petition for the senators and, you know, take action. I mean, you know, we really are at the um, at a really exciting time with a new start, with a new administration, and there's really possibilities of making a change, and we all really could use that. So um, I look forward to that. 
So I want to share with you this week's recipe on what I made was a roasted squash breakfast tortilla. And um, I start, I'm first going to share the ingredients with you and then what you need to do to bring it together. So uh, you start with one package of organic gluten-free corn tortillas, one cup of organic salsa, one large onion, one roasted butternut squash that you cut into pieces, five baby potatoes, one to two cups of broccoli florets cut bite size, one red jalapeno pepper diced finely, one sweet pepper, <clears throat> and I had a purple one for my garden that I used, although I've now put my garden to bed, um, some olive oil for sauteing, one bunch of fresh cilantro washed and chopped, a half a teaspoon cumin, salt and pepper to taste. You can use grated vegan cheese if you'd like, or you don't need anything like that at all. An avocado and some lime. So you're gonna start by sauteing the, sauteing the onion and the potatoes in a little olive oil on some medium heat for 10 minutes until they're soft. Then add the broccoli and the peppers and cook that for another five minutes or so. Add the squash, the sauce and the cumin, and then the salt to taste. Um, then add two tablespoons of the chopped cilantro. And in a large skillet, spray that with a little of nonstick oil and warm each tortilla for just about 30 seconds on each side. Lay the tortillas out on a cookie sheet, spread the squash mixture on top of each tortilla, and then you can sprinkle it with some of the grated vegan cheese if you'd like. Um, you can also, if you want, make a little uh, cream sauce with some soaked cashews and some lime juice and some fresh cilantro and um, serve it with that as well. Um, broil the tortillas until the vegan cheese starts to melt if you're using that. And then top each tortilla with a little more salsa and some of the fresh cilantro. And that is it. Um, and that is it. So I hope you all check it out and enjoy it. And of course, let me know how you like it because I love to um, get feedback on the recipes. So I wanted to now introduce to all of you my guest this week, Dr. Jeffrey Rediger. He is an MD and faculty um, at Harvard Medical School, and he's the medical director of McLean Adult Psychiat Psychiatry and Community Affairs at McLean Hospital and chief of behavioral medicine at Good Samaritan Medical Center. He's a licensed physician and board certified psychiatrist. He's also a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. His research with remarkable individuals who have recovered from illness considered incurable has been featured on the Oprah Winfrey Show, the Dr. Oz Show, among others. He has been nominated for the National Brave Well Leadership Award and has received numerous awards related to leadership and patient care. And his book, Cured, is really just so great. And I'm so happy to... Um, be able to share it all with all, all of you today. Hi, Jeffrey, how are you? Hi, how are you? Good. I'm trying to get my video working and it's not working. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Oh, there. Is that working now? Can you see me? Not anyway, yet. how are you? Uh, very good. Good. So I'm loving your book. I haven't finished it yet, but it is really great. But I thought maybe we could just backtrack a little and you could share with my audience. Um, what the book Cured is all about. Well, thank you. Uh, so Cured is the culmination of 17 years of going deep into the lives of people who have medical evidence for recovery from illnesses that we consider incurable. And it's been quite a personal and professional journey for me to hear these stories and look at this medical evidence. As a physician, I was trained to make a diagnosis and start a medication, but it's been a really different uh, course of education for me to begin understanding at a deep level what it takes to heal illness. And uh, it's been a, a fantastic journey for me. Uh huh. Well, it's a fantastic book, and it's, you know, I think in the introduction, when you talked about um, lecturing to a room full of doctors and you asked how many of them have actually witnessed a spontaneous healing or a miracle healing yeah. and almost everyone admitted that they had. And then when you asked how many really reported on it, 
all their hands went down and it was just like, it was so, I wasn't surprised, but it was just really amazing because I think it's, you know, that is just a perfect example of how often it actually does happen and yet it's not really talked about. Yes, in medical school, we are taught that these kinds of healings are rare and that they are flukes with no medical or scientific value. If you are on the science side, you call these events spontaneous remission. If you are on the spiritual or religious side, you call these uh, events spiritual healing or miracles. And we're taught that they are rare, but the truth is these terms are black boxes that we've never unpacked uh, with the tools of science and they are not near as rare as we think they are. It's just that doctors are afraid to actually look at these things and let them be what they are. I mean, the medical model is really powerful and doctors are socialized into this very powerful model. And there's, it's life-saving in many ways, but there's also aspects of what it takes to heal and create well-being that the model does not look at at all. And that's something I hope we can change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, you know, I actually worked with medical students at some point in my career many years ago. And, um, you know, when I ha was told how little nutrition education they actually got, yeah. you know, it was shocking. I mean, they spend a few hours, I think, in their whole four years of medical education. And I know it's a lot more than really four years, but so little time is really spent on how to eat well. And then in your book, you even go into how many doctors don't eat well because you're so busy, right. you're just, you know, eating that cold pizza at the nurse's station or whatever. Yeah. So um, maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, diet and how um, diet plays a part of these miraculous healings. Yeah, I mean, nutrition is a big deal. Food is medicine when we understand that. And we have a medical model that doesn't understand that. It's not that doctors don't get much education in nutrition. That is true. But a lot of the education we do get about nutrition is misinformation. I remember very clearly in my second year of medical school, uh, we talked a little bit about nutrition, but we were told, and I remember where I was sitting when we were talking about this in the class, we were told that the problem is not um, lack of nutrition in Western culture. The problem is overnutrition and that the problem is simply that people eat too much. Well, it turns out that's not true. Um, I think the standard American diet has is lacking of basic micronutrients and phytochemicals at such a deep level that people and people have no idea about this level of malnutrition that creates disease, that's disease creating. It isn't that uh, the standard American diet um, when it is exported to other countries, it's not that that diet uh, creates more disease. It's not that it creates more heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, cancer, autoimmune illness. It's that it creates this at an exponential level. And so, for example, I have a friend who has an organic olive farm in Greece, and he's a physician, and he told me that there's a tragedy unfolding in Athens right now. In most of Greece, people have been eating the Mediterranean diet for many centuries, but in Athens, it's now cool to get a cheeseburger, fries, and a Coke. And unfortunately, the rates of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and autoimmune disease are skyrocketing now in Athens, he said. And that's something we see over and over again. And so how to help people recover a true understanding of nutrition is a massive deal. It's complicated because the collusion between industry, government, and academics who are paid by industry to do the studies that teach us what nutrition is, is, is deeply problematic. And so that's something that's slowly starting to change, but it's been a very difficult uh, path to change this into true and helpful information for people. Yeah. Well, I think the American diet is our biggest export and it really is doing um, such damage around the world. I mean, what you just described is also happening in China and Japan and yes. you know, Asian countries that never ate dairy and this kind of fast food um, yeah. are experiencing that as well. And, yeah. um, you know, and then of course we also go into, um, I think one of 
the fa- you know, one of the lines that I really love from your book, the pathogen is nothing. It's the terrain that's everything. Yes. And, you know, as a gardener, a farmer and a NOFA board member, the Northeast Organic Farming Association, I'm so um, committed to the importance of soil when you're growing food. And, you know, yeah. I have for years said all broccolis are not created equal. I mean, if you have broccoli that's, you know, grown in a, you know, a monoculture big farm with fertilizers and, you know, soil that is virtually dead of all the microorganisms, yes. it's going to be a very different broccoli than a broccoli that was grown organically with compost and a real rich soil filled with like lots of microorganisms. And, you know, I think it's the same thing, you know, for a mother who's, you know, pregnant, you know, what she's eating and what she's feeding her baby yeah. is, you know, it makes a huge difference. Huge difference. So, yeah. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit uh, about that. Um, you know, what are the four pillars of healing that, you know, you talk about in your book? Yes. So, uh, you know, I watched these people uh, over a period of many years and went deep into what helped them recover health and vitality and well-being after being told that they had this this incurable illness. And there are certain patterns that you see over and over ac- across a wide range of illnesses. And nutrition is the first pillar. Nutrition is a big one. Nutrition uh, is exactly what you're talking about. It's about filling your body with micronutrients, phytochemicals, a plant-based diet that gives your body what it needs. Now, I do tell the story of one person who recovered from cancer, uh, which he attributed to a keto diet. But I think the jury is still out in terms of the long-term effects of the keto diet. I I do believe that the plant-based diet is really important when it's based on whole foods. Uh, like you're speaking about. Uh, the issues around animal products are complicated and certainly impacted in part because of the chemicals, the antibiotics, the steroids, and uh, the living conditions of the animals uh, that uh, makes it more complicated than just healthy meat. Um, there's a lot of stress hormones these animals um, secrete into their bodies because of the stressful living conditions. There's a number of issues around the animal products uh, that are complicated and that we need to understand better. Yeah. Um, you know, the one example that you have, you know, in the introduction, this woman, Claire, <clears throat> right, who yeah. had pancreatic cancer. And, you know, that's pretty much, you know, uh, I don't want to say a death sentence, but very few people really come back from pancreatic cancer. It's right. one of the worst ones. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, she made the choice to really not do anything and to just live out the rest of her life as fully as possible. Right. And just that act of really choosing to live her life fully, she had a miraculous healing. You want to talk about that example? I mean, it, I just loved it because it was, you know, one, it was the one of the first ones you talked about in the book, but it was just so powerful because... She focused on living, you know, because I think, um, you know, you also say, you know, the person who takes medicine must recover twice, you know, once from the disease and once from the medicine. And that's also so true. You know, so often the chemo and all that stuff that people do to cure themselves can make they can die from that. Yes. Yeah. I really learned so much from Claire, as I did from so many of the people I've had the opportunity to study. And Claire's got a really important story. Uh, She was diagnosed by biopsy with pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which is the worst kind of pancreatic cancer you can have. And she fully expected to die. She was a woman who had always followed the recommendations of her doctor and valued science. But when she was told that she only had a matter of months to live, she, and and when she was told that the uh, radiation, the chemotherapy, the surgery, that in her case, that was at best only going to lengthen her life for a few months, but leave her potentially with a lot of side effects that she wasn't interested in living with. She decided that in her situation, she wanted to focus on quality of life. She wanted to spend time with the people she loved for those last matter of months, rather than sitting in doctor's offices with other people who were dying. 
And so even though she uh, does not recommend that this is what everyone does, uh, she said that for her, this was the right decision. And that's what she did. That was in 2008. And, and then in 2013, she had a CT scan of the abdomen for unrelated reasons and the cancer was gone. She had never expected to live that long. She had never expected to get better. She just decided to focus on life and love and quality of life and was shocked that things began to get better for her. And so, yeah, and one of the things that she did was she really changed her nutrition fundamentally. Uh, so that's certainly one of the pillars of healing and well-being that she illustrated really well with her life. Mm -hmm. um, but another thing that I really love that you talk about is not necessarily changing everything that the the pleasures the the parts of food that really trigger uh, a happy place in you is also really important to maintain and you know i one of the things that i do is i cook for people with cancer and i cook for people you know medicinally um who are you know going through something and I always start when I meet with them, I was like, well, what foods are you craving? What foods really make you happy? Because to take everything away can make them miserable. And that's certainly not going to help he the healing process either. So yeah. you really have to balance it. So you, can you talk a little bit about the balance? Yeah. Well, the point is to, at the end of the day, you want to end up with more love and more connection in your lives, right? And food is love. Food is community. Food is connection. And so so I also tell the story and cure of people who didn't change their diet, who still got better. And so diet and nutrition are really important, but they're not the only factor that's important. And Claire is a good example of somebody who understood that. So she, she did, she eliminated a lot of the processed foods in her life. She completely cleaned out her pantry. She went plant-based um, for most of what she did. And, she talks about this on her website in more detail than I had time to cover and cure. But she also loved pizza. And so she kept some pizza in her life. She kept some desserts in her life that did have sugar in them. And, and so was able to find a path that, that yes, did make deep nutritional changes, but also she understood intuitively she needed more love and connection in her life. And that that was also important. Mm -hmm. So um, in your studying of the people, can you share with us some, you know, some more of the commonalities that really um, that you highlight in the book that yeah. you think are most important? Yeah. So another factor you've already touched on this whole thing about the inner terrain that we create in our bodies. Um, that's that's really about healing the immune system. For 30 years, uh, we have had a, an accumulation of research that's talking about the microbiome, that talks about healing the gut, healing the immune system. 80% of our immune system is in our guts. And so the food that we take into our bodies is fundamentally related to the opportunities we have to heal the immune system. So it turns out that what's exciting is that a person doesn't have diabetes or heart disease or an autoimmune disease or cancer or other illnesses in quite the way that we've thought about this stuff for a long time. The truth is what a person has at a deeper level is chronic inflammation in their bodies. And it's the chronic inflammation that weakens our bodily organs over time and then eventually results in disease, whether that's diabetes or heart disease or cancer or whatever. So if a person wants to heal the illness at a deeper level, then you need to heal the chronic inflammation. And that chronic inflammation is the sign of an immune system that's gone awry. So a person might think that if they have cancer, well, that's not an immune system problem. Or if they have heart disease, that's not an immune system problem. Well, actually it is because it's the chronic inflammation that has resulted that creates the hardening of the arteries or the um, cell, the cells that go off on their own and mutate and, and cause cancer. It's these kinds of things that are related to chronic inflammation that is 
creating the disease patterns. And so healing the immune system is a really big deal. That's also a big deal in this time of COVID, in a pandemic when so many people are dying, not necessarily from COVID, but with COVID, because it exposes the pre-existing problems in their health, whether it was the heart disease or the obesity or the um, diabetes or the high blood pressure, these other pre-existing problems, which are a sign of an immune system that's not working properly. And then you bring COVID into that and, and it's kind of an accelerant that uh, makes things worse for people, unfortunately. So healing the immune system is a big deal. It's a really different way of thinking about things. Uh, it's very exciting that this research into the microbiome has been accumulating for 30 years, but it hasn't fundamentally impacted daily practice in our hospitals and clinics yet. And that's the paradigm shift that is going to occur, uh, but we need to help it occur. Mm -hmm. um, in, in your career, have you seen, like how many doctors that you work with are really open to this information? Because you know, it seems to me that there's still the majority of doctors are you know prescribing pills and antibiotics right. and and you know surgeries and all the all yeah. the you know let's fix the symptom but not really get to the root cause right are you seeing that paradigm shift in the medical profession because i think that's where it needs to come from yeah that's that's where it needs to come from i think uh, there's so many things that keep modern medicine um, moving in this direction because modern medicine, there, there's a lot of well-meaning doctors and healthcare providers who, who just simply are not aware of this fundamental uh, growth of a new paradigm that's occurring in the research. The things that keep doctors and healthcare providers with their heads down and just simply trying to keep up is, first of all, they're really busy and the there's a whole combination of insurance companies, regulatory networks, and licensing bodies that a certain perspective in place and keep doctors working with a paradigm and a way of thinking that is increasingly outmoded, but it's very difficult to change when, first of all, these, uh, this new information is not easily getting through to the doctors or the healthcare providers, and you've got all these insurance companies and healthcare uh, regulatory networks and licensing bodies that keep the old models in place. Uh, doctors tend to be really busy with pressures on them to do more and more work in less and less time and to see how to work differently is really difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had a guest on who, you know, was um, hired to start a whole uh, heart clinic at the Detroit hospital. Yeah. And, you know, he just, he did it for a couple of years and was healing people through diet and they eventually closed him down because he wasn't bringing in money for the hospital. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, right. there's also this, um, this, situation that you know if you actually follow this paradigm if you actually change people's mm -hmm. diets and help them you are going to lose business yes and so that gets into mm -hmm. a, a you know a quandary i'm sure for many doctors it's very challenging because your choices then are very limited because if you want to be helpful for people you are not going to be reimbursed for it unless you set up a private pay practice, which only those who have a lot of money can afford. So what I'm happy about is there's the Academy of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is now a growing organization that's beginning to really gain some political and research momentum to show that if you do the kind of work we are talking about today to help people really change their lifestyles, wake up to what it means to create real health and well-being in their lives, that these illnesses become much less of an issue and they don't have to be dependent on medications for the rest of their lives in most cases. So that's beginning to grow, but exactly right. Uh, you can't easily get reimbursement for these kinds of things and reimbursement does matter. I mean, doctors also need to be able to take care of their families. And so 
the lack of awareness and the lack of support for um, doing these kinds of things is really an issue. Now, I will say modern medicine is brilliant at pulling people back from the brink of death and helping people tread water with their illnesses. You know, insulin or blood or blood pressure medications or medications for heart disease, they can keep a person alive. But unfortunately, the disease can often progress underneath these medications. The medications are only treating symptoms and tread water, but they're not treating the cause. They're not healing the chronic inflammation underneath it all. And so the life-saving part of medicine is fabulous, but we've got to shift the paradigm so that we can also take care of what it means to heal illnesses. Most of the illnesses that people suffer from, the heart disease, the diabetes, the high blood pressure, the cancer, the autoimmune diseases, these are lifestyle illnesses, and many of them are reversible. 85 to 90% of what people are suffering from are lifestyle illnesses, but they're not treated that way. That mm -hmm. needs to change. Yeah, I am so with you. Um, let's take just a couple minute break. When we come back, I'd like to have you share with us some of those changes that you really talk about in your book the, mm -hmm. that really can help reverse the chronic inflammation that's at the root of so, much, so many of these illnesses. So everyone, don't go anywhere. I'm talking with Dr. Jeffrey Rediger about his book, Cured, and you're listening to Bhavani at IE Green. Be right back. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, my guest today is Dr. Jeffrey Rediger. We are talking about his book called Cured, which is an amazing book about um, healing yourself with diet and lifestyle changes. And it's just amazing. So, um, Jeffrey, before the uh, break, I was asking you, what, um, what have you learned from doing this research and what in your book do you really recommend people doing mostly to change their diet in order to reverse the chronic inflammation that most of us are living with? Yes. So maybe one thing I should say about nutrition is that it's important to not make changes from a place of fear as much as possible. Fear might help a person get started when they've been diagnosed with a scary disease. But fear is not sustainable long term in terms of bringing about deep change. So one needs, I think we all need positive emotions in our lives. Again, we want food to, um, the decisions around food to increase the amount of love and connection that we have in our lives. And so I tell people it's from what I've learned uh, from my study, uh, it's important to uh, focus on the nutrition you are giving yourself, not just on what you were giving up. And every person has to find a unique prescription for themselves in terms of how to bring more nutrition into their lives since food is shared. And so uh, the decisions around how to improve nutrition requires unique solutions that really work in our families and in those we share food with. And so it's not one prescription uh, fits all in regards to this. It needs some careful consideration. I think it's also important to um, understand that it, it really is the processed foods, it's the sugar, it's the refined flour, the huge amount of this in our lives, our bodies aren't built to handle. I saw a study that said that 100 years ago, we ate four pounds of sugar a year on average, each person. Now that's more like 154 pounds per year that each person takes in because sugar is buried in everything. It's in the corn syrups, it's in the, um, the drinks, it's in many of the foods that people buy, and it's often hidden. And so people just aren't aware of how much they're consuming and our bodies just were not built to handle that. And so what we might say, let's find something, a more moderate pathway. Well, yeah, that's all well and good. But if, if, if a person, if what's considered average is so over the top, 154 pounds of sugar on average per year per person, the body just isn't built to manage that. And so that's a significant source of all the illness that people experience in their lives, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, they sneak sugar into everything. So yeah. when you say sugar, it's not like only cut out sweets. It's also look at the tomato sauce you're buying. Have yeah. they added sugar into the tomato sauce? Look at the salsa. Is there added sugar? Look at the ketchup. I mean, ketchup always has sugar. <laughs> but, you know, you really have to look at the ingredients in what you're um, putting in. And also, um, you know, when you're looking at those ingredients, you not only look for sugar, look for all those things that you can't pronounce. Right. All those things that you can't pronounce, they shouldn't be in there either. You know, when I'm making yeah. something, you know, I know the ingredients that have to go into something as a chef yeah. and all those things that I can't pronounce, I never add. So, yeah. Right. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And what's really fabulous, though, is that people like you and more and more people are educating us on what genuine nutrition is and what a plant based whole foods diet is without all the chemicals that uh, are so disruptive to the microbiome. Mm -hmm. So the kind of work that you were doing and others are doing is slowly opening up to us a whole new world. I was such a slow learner and I'm a physician. You would think I would have known this stuff, but it took me a long time to realize, oh, there's all these great tasting foods out there that are healthy. And I just did not know about them. And so once one begins to make a shift, the world opens up and one's taste buds wake up again. Um, but it, I was a slow learner. And if with the kind of research I was doing, and if I was a slow learner, that has to be that way for lots of others as well. Yeah. Well, actually, I was surprised. You talk about in your book that when you came back from Brazil, where you went down to this healing center, and you came back and you, you know, witnessed and spoke to all these people that had these uh, miraculous cures, you know, I would have expected that you would have come back and just shifted your whole diet. And you said, no, you came back and you kind of like fell back into your status quo. Right. Want to talk a little bit about that and what was your journey to yes. make the shift? Right. Yeah. You know, I was, I was a slow learner for a number of reasons. Probably I was raised on a farm, raised cattle. We always had, you know, we, we uh, raised cattle for meat. And, and so I grew up with meat three times a day and, the normal diet and thinking, well, I had some vegetables with my meat and I thought that was probably pretty good, but I didn't really get it. And so in Brazil, that was the beginning of being exposed to a very different pathway, but you come back to uh, your job and I was new medical director at McLean and young faculty member at Harvard and really busy and surrounded by all the pizza and brownies and and uh, the kinds and of the Dunkin' Donuts that pe that <laughs> thankful patients families leave at the nurse station for Absolutely. you. <laughs> yeah. and and so I was thinking, oh yeah, I have some vegetables every day, but I was not paying any attention to the fact that every time I passed the nurse station, I'd often pick up a cookie or a bread, right. and, and wasn't aware. I was kind of unconscious of how much I was putting other stuff into my body. And over time, I began to gain weight, and my numbers started to go up in terms of blood pressure and cholesterol and all that. And it really, I was such a slow learner and yet I was studying this stuff. And it wasn't really until I started this research in 2003 and it wasn't, it was such a slow realization that boy, nutrition really is important here. These people are telling me about their nutritional changes over and over. And so slowly over the years, I began to make deep changes in my nutrition and ended up building a completely different body because of these, what I was taught by these individuals. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about fermented foods in the body as far mm -hmm. as um, working with the um, microbiome? Yeah. So the microbiome, our gut, loves fermented foods because that creates the nutritional structure of what healthy uh, bacteria, for example, like to eat. And so that we all have different microbiomes. We all come from different ancestries, different parts of the world different experiences and the um, fermented foods create the, give the nutrition that allow a healthy um, set of bacteria to grow in our bodies. And so that allows us to uh, continue to make progress with healing our microbiomes in a time when the microbiome science is still young. We don't know what a healthy balance is for every individual. And so giving the nutrition that allows each individual to uh, grow their own microbiome is, is a good way to get started on this new pathway. Uh huh. Um, and how about stress? How, how does stress play into one's health? 
It's a big deal. And stress, uh, changing our relationship with stress is the third pillar that I describe in Cured. It is uh, uh, important to understand that many of us live too much in fight or flight, fight, flight, or freeze much of the time. And, you know, I think it's, it's good to uh, have a response to threats on the horizon. If there is a tiger that appears on the horizon uh, in terms of our ancestry, uh, it's important to see that tiger quicker uh, rather than later. But you don't want to stay in fight or flight with that physiology um, much of the time. The physiology of fight or flight means that uh, stress hormones like cortisol and norepinephrine are being secreted onto uh, your body, onto the cells of your brilliant immune system. And when those brilliant cell subtypes are constantly flooded with cortisol or norepinephrine, they become sluggish or they begin to misfire or fire incorrectly, or they begin to attack your own body instead of attacking the pathogen, whether that is a bacterial infection or a viral infection like um, the coronavirus or something else. And so you want those cells to be taken care of um, with a healing physiology rather than the, uh, the stress hormones constantly being secreted in your body. So now I should probably say that uh, not all stress is bad. We all need what we can call challenge stress to help us grow and learn. I'm a runner. I really enjoy running and uh, that can be stressful for the body, absolutely. But that's a challenge stress and that helps me develop and develop a stronger, uh, uh, healthier body. Running a marathon can be a challenge stress that helps you reach into your higher self and expand your understanding of what you're capable of. But, but what, I, what I see as a physician and a psychiatrist every day is that if a person is in a toxic relationship or if they finish work every day depleted or run down and questioning their value and worth, then something needs to change because they're going to be in chronic fight, flight, or freeze, and they're not going to be able to heal properly. So the physiology of being in the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the opposite system from fight, flight, or freeze. It's the physiology of healing and well-being that your body loves and that helps your immune system wake up and for those cell subtypes to function efficiently and correctly and to attack the pathogen rather than become confused and attack your own body. That's the physiology that is so fundamentally different. And I can talk about that as much as you would like. It's a really different kind of physiology that your body loves. Mm -hmm. And you touched on this before, and I was really glad to hear, and I thought maybe we could expand on a little bit. When people eat meat that is factory farmed, yeah. they are eating the stress that that animal is feeding, yes. uh, feeling while waiting online to be slaughtered. Yes. Can you talk about yeah. how that yes. affects someone's body. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if, if a person eats animals that were very stressed and were in that fight or flight mode themselves, then you're taking that same physiology into your body and those stress hormones and all of that has a profound impact on the human body. So I tell people, if you're going to eat meat, then I recommend that you limit that to 5% or less of your weekly intake and eat animals that were happy when they were alive, you know, um, grass fed so that you get the healthier fats and not pumped full of chemicals or living in stress. Or antibiotics. Right? Or antibiotics. Yeah, you know, the antibiotic, I tell, uh, I report on some research in here about how you can um, look at the number of times a woman has had antibiotics in their life, for example. And, and there is a direct correlation between the number of antibiotic trials that a person has taken in their lives and their risk of breast cancer. And it's not just that a, if a person has had antibiotics, that they have an increased risk of breast cancer. It's a dose dependent reaction. In other words, the more times a person has taken antibiotics, the more times, the, the higher the risk of breast cancer. And so what that indicates is that antibiotics can be life-saving in certain situations, but when we overuse them and when we take antibiotics instead of healing our immune systems so that we're not so susceptible to infections, then that's the issue because 
because these antibiotics can be life-saving in the moment when they are really needed, but they also do weaken the immune system down the road. And it's a weakened immune system that uh, gives rise to cell mutations that then become cancer. And if you have a sluggish immune system that can't pick up these mutated cells early and kick them out of the body, then you're going to be vulnerable to things like cancer. And so it's, it's really important to be healing our immune systems rather than just taking medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think you're so right. And so where do you stand in this vaccination that's coming after COVID? Um, you know, I know, like we talked about, it, unfortunately, the communities um, of color and indigenous communities that are really, you know, struggling with the numbers so profoundly with COVID because of their um, weakened immune systems. Yeah. Um, where do you, where do you stand with um, your feelings on vaccinations in general, and especially this COVID one? Yeah, that's a really big topic. You know, there's vaccinations vary across a wide spectrum in terms of their efficacy and their safety, and I uh, don't believe we have enough information uh, in regards to the vaccines for the coronavirus that are just coming out. There's a lot we don't know yet about their uh, efficacy or safety. There's some studies that were put together to show that they do appear to have some efficacy and so that could be really important and we'll see how that bears out over time with uh, more uh, uh, understanding of them. Um, yeah, I think it's important to understand that some vaccines can be really important, some don't seem to have that much efficacy at all, some don't have near the level of efficacy that we were hoping they would have, um, so every vaccination has to be looked at in its own, um, on it, in itself, because I think that we can't just make blanket um, pronouncements about the uh, quality or lack of efficacy of vaccinations. So there's a lot we don't know about the coronavirus vaccines, but I think we just need to make sure that they have genuine efficacy um, that remains to be seen and that they are actually safe. Uh, I have not looked into whether the uh, mercury uh, as a substrate um, in the vac in these vaccines has been eliminated. That's something else to look at. Um, I know over the years when I've been asked about uh, getting vaccines, it's it's required as a physician that I do so since I work in hospitals. But I just make sure that the nurse shakes the vial well before administering the vaccine uh, because um, I don't want the thimerosal, the mercury that settles out to uh, be injected uh, is a major dose into my system because it wasn't shaken properly. So there's a lot of issues with vaccinations and there's a lot we don't know about the current uh, vaccine, vaccines for the coronavirus. Yeah, you know, because I guess when my kids were younger, you know, I really questioned, you know, giving my kids vaccinations. And I mm -hmm. felt like, you know, like you said, some I felt like, you know, it was really worth giving to them because it was a life-threatening thing. But others, you know, like I had chicken pox, I had mumps, you know, it yeah. was no big deal. I mean, it, yeah. you know, and it's much better to get it as a child. And then it teaches your immune system how to fight off something naturally. Right. Um, you know, I know you talk about your gut also just with, um, you know, a feeling in your gut, you know, like your mm -hmm. intuition gut. Right. And in my intuition gut says, you know, we're giving too many vaccinations and that that's affecting people's immune system yeah. that we're, you know, force feeding them um, these things so that their immune systems don't learn to fight things off themselves. Do you think yeah. there's any validity to my gut feeling here? Yeah, I think you're raising uh, big, complicated issues. And for some of this, we don't even have the research to address some of those those issues. Um I'm a big believer in developing a strong and robust immune system uh, that is really capable of fending off uh, the pathogens, whether it's a bacterial problem or a viral problem, et cetera. And I think there's so much that can be done that we just don't have on our screens as part of our awareness that's a possibility. So I just think it's important to understand that vaccines often are not the silver bullets that we hope they are. Um, sometimes, like with smallpox and that sort of thing, they can be really helpful. But with other 
vaccinations, whether it's the flu vaccines or others, they're not as helpful as we would wish. And it's a lot more hit or miss than we uh, easily see. And so I think we have to look at each individual situation. And we also need to understand that there's a lot we can do to create really strong immune systems that whether that body then gets a vaccine or not, it's a whole different situation when it comes to fighting off illness. And that's that is something I know we can do a lot more with and by and large doctors and nurses and normal people living their lives are just not aware of. Mm -hmm. So um, just going back to the four pillars, yeah. um, I have down the plant-based diet, you know, really increasing that. Um, you're building up your inner terrain, healing the immune system and the gut. Stress, what was the fourth? The fourth is healing our identity and our false beliefs. And this is a big one. Um, we all grow up uh, in listening to the messages that we get from our parents, from our siblings, from kids on the playground, from our teachers, from uh, employers. And I think over time, we develop a set of true and false beliefs about who we are. And uh, some of these beliefs are very true and empowering and other beliefs are simply false. But for the most part, many of these beliefs are unexamined. And what I've come to see uh, in the study of these uh, remarkable individuals is that if we uh, don't examine the false beliefs that we have about our value or who we are as human beings and eliminate those, uh, then we are going to live with this inner conflict, whether it's conscious or subconscious. Um, and um, in, I think if you have a set of mixed beliefs, some true and some untrue, it's, you're going to have mixed results in your life and in your health and in your bodies. And so what I've seen over time is how these individuals often will go deep into their beliefs and heal their identities and realize that they're not this defective individual, or it's not that they are not good enough in some way. They begin to realize they bring something really beautiful and important into the world. And they begin to see the importance of healing those beliefs, healing their negative uh, perceptions of themselves and seeing themselves with compassion and understanding in a way that can be truly healing to them. And it's so fascinating to me that every individual I've studied has told me that in spite of the fact that they had this life-threatening illness, in the end, they were grateful for it because so, it so fundamentally changed their experience of themselves and the world they live in. They so fundamentally changed their beliefs about their value and what they bring into the world because of what this illness forced upon them. And that's been an astonishing thing to see. Um, one of the most common things that people have told me over the years is that it took an illness for them to wake up and realize that they needed to stop taking care of everyone else. They needed to stop responding to the perceived expectations of others and instead also pay attention to what creates life and authentic well-being within them. You know, one of the women I studied, uh, she was always this very demure, lovely, sweet person. But she was diagnosed with breast cancer. In the context of her recovery, she began to realize that, that her husband, maybe he loved her in some ways, but he also was quite caustic in his way of interacting with her, quite harsh. And as she learned to stand up for herself, she learned to uh, really focus on the things that create life and well-being in her. She began to be less demure, less uh, always taking care of everyone else, but to stand up and really assertively say what she felt, what she authentically felt. And she became more, uh, more outspoken and, uh, and this person who's going to tell you what she really thinks rather than always keeping this stuff inside. And I think that was really important for her. And I really believe it contributed to her healing. And it certainly gave her a quality of life and a level of happiness and freedom that she had not experienced before. And I see that kind of thing over and over to such a degree that I have uh, begun doing this thing with people where I often will help them set up a selfish bitch project because people will tell me they've spent so many years taking care of everyone else, doing what others need for them. And they have neglected their own needs and well-being for so many years. And so people initially will feel selfish with the kinds of new activities and perceptions that I'm asking them to set up. And it's not, it's not selfish. It's not selfish to 
also pay attention to one's own well-being and what creates an authentic life that helps you come alive, that puts a light in your eyes and makes you excited about your life. That's a fabulous thing. And it changes one's relationship with oneself and others in a way that is life-giving and health nourishing. Mm -hmm. Wow. You've given us so much to think about. And um, we are just about out of time. I just, you know, just want to add to the conversation um, about meditation because you touch on that as well. And I think, you know, just to deal with the stress and to deal with the healing of our identity, um, meditation is just such a wonderful tool that I think so many people don't know about. Um, One minute on that. Yeah. Yeah, Meditation is to come into a different relationship with yourself I have seen people be in psychotherapy for years and then they sometimes will go to a meditation or yoga workshop and gain such an improved understanding of their value and the dignity and beauty of what they bring in the world in that one week than they gained in years of just talking about change in their lives. And so it's important at the end of the day to have a new experience where you experience the dignity and beauty of who you are and the goodness of that and feel good about that and feel good about investing in your own health and well-being and to not feel guilty about that or to feel that that is selfish somehow and meditation is a huge help for some people in that path yeah well thank you i want to thank you so much for this book and for your research and for helping to change the paradigm that has to change and, um, you know, coming from your background with your credentials is, you know, so important because, I mean, I can talk till I'm blue, but, you know, I don't have the, those credentials that give me the validity of people really listening. So thank you for your work and um, so much. And everyone out there who's been joining us today, thank you for joining us. And um, I wish you all a wonderful week. Stay healthy. Eat well. And I'll see you all again next week. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you.